This is the second in our series on huge changes that are taking place in travel. Many of us would like to think when we decide to head to another country that we're going to step into an economy that is good for local people. After all, the international tourism economy is mostly made up of small, independent local businesses. But at the top of the pile sits a handful of unavoidable, massive corporations. This local gentleman's offered to take me across this river for a look at the cave that's over the other side. Pretty, feeling pretty fortunate. <laughs> Look at this country. Borders have reopened and travel has resumed for nearly a year now. And I've spent most of that year on the road making up for lost travel time. I've come away feeling more aware than ever of the privilege it is to travel. But I've also come away with another awareness, and that is that travel has changed forever. One of the biggest changes is the collection of huge companies most of them just a couple of decades old, that dominate the top levels of the tourism economy. It doesn't feel like long ago that stepping outside an international airport terminal would mean stepping into a new economy. But now, a handful of global corporations are with you everywhere you go. And they exercise a lot of influence about how we travel, the things we do, the ways we spend our money. This is the part of travel we'd probably all rather forget about. So uh, I've seated myself in these beautiful gardens as a bit of a distraction, but this is really important stuff. And you can always depend on Rusty Compass to make long videos about tedious subjects like the tourism economy. So stay with me. When you decide to travel, there's a fair chance you'll do a Google search or look at a YouTube video or head over to Instagram or TikTok. These digital giants will, for the most part, tip you into a tourism economy of other huge corporations. Google, the owner of this platform, YouTube, is by many measures the biggest travel company on the planet. Owning Google Search, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Images, Google Reviews, Google Flights, Google Ads, the Android operating system, the Chrome browser, and more, gives Google a dominant role in the information travellers consume as they prepare to travel, the data required to build detailed profiles on traveller tastes and interests, and the online economy where travel products are bought and sold. They provide incredible convenience while you're on the road, but how much are these convenient products shaping the way we travel? What about airlines and airports? They are also big players in the tourism economy. There has been a lot of pain at airports this year as they've struggled to resume normal operations. But from where I'm sitting, it looks like a special rage has been directed at airlines. I find most travellers to be pretty reasonable and pretty understanding of the idea that after two pandemic years, it would be difficult 
for airlines and airports to flick a switch and resume normal operations. What I'm hearing is that travellers are furious about the indifference and occasional nastiness they experience from airlines when they need a problem to be solved. It's not about frontline staff. It's about cynical management decisions that determine customer service resources, processes, and resolution protocols. Here in Australia, our once universally cherished national carrier, Qantas, has been the subject of months of community anger across countless scandals. But the profits and CEO bonuses might indicate that a tolerance for community rage is a virtue in today's aviation business. I've had run-ins with Singapore Airlines and its budget carrier Scoot this year. Both seem to start with the proposition that they should exhaust customers with process, no matter how reasonable and obvious the issue. Hello. Singapore Airlines ended up providing a full refund, but only after lengthy email exchanges where nothing changed from the very first email they received. Scoot seemed to be answering complaints with a bot, so I never really got any meaningful response to my complaint. So do these words mean anything to you? Dynamic pricing. It's hard to imagine a setting where you feel less inclined to think about dynamic pricing. As far as I can work out, travellers never really signed up to be part of the dynamic pricing experiment. But you do experience it every time you travel. What is it? Well, it's real-time demand-based pricing. It's the thing that means that prices fluctuate wildly across a day, across a week, across a month. Technology and market power mean that companies like airlines, Google, the big online travel agents have near perfect information about demand at any given time. That means near perfect information about how to price their products in real time. Travellers have long known there are seasons with changing prices and in the past they could plan around those changes. Not anymore. Now with dynamic pricing, pricing can change by the minute. And there don't seem to be too many limits on how high prices can go. Many travellers have been caught out by wild swings in airfares this year. Sometimes prices can spike while you're in the process of making a booking. Uber's surge pricing is a pretty good example of dynamic pricing in action. And there's another important dynamic pricing issue. How often do these large digital travel companies use the personal profile data they have accumulated on you to tailor pricing to your budget profile? One of the reasons dynamic pricing is so pervasive in online travel is that a small number of huge companies dominate that whole economy. Two online travel agencies, Booking Holdings and Expedia, are so ubiquitous and so far ahead of their rivals, their market power is immense. Key to the business model is a massive advertising spend with Google and a curious dominance of Google's organic search results. Google's organic search results are not ads. They are supposed to be based on the quality and integrity of the pages they are recommending. TripAdvisor is another player that sits at the top of the industry that has a less than stellar record in promoting the best values of travel. Right now though, TripAdvisor looks to be losing ground to Google's dominance in the review space. The other huge player is Airbnb. Airbnb captures pretty perfectly the dilemmas of these big tech players in travel. 
I love the concept and I love the tech, but in practice I have lots of misgivings too. Airbnb is bigger than any of the big international hotel chains. It seems to be the only big tech play in travel that has to deal with a fair bit of public scrutiny. These online travel markets have none of the characteristics that excite theoretical economists when they talk about the power of markets to produce price competition, innovation, and advance the interests of consumers and workers. Travelers are increasingly discovering that the odds are stacked against them. The markets of the digital travel giants have none of the elegance of a purchase of a banana or a delicious bitter melon at this Hoi An market. And they sure don't have the wonderful humans. My new friend in the market. Cô cô tên là gì nhỉ? Cô tên là Hoa. Hoa hả? Rất là vui nói chuyện với Hoa đấy. I kind of feel like the online space needs more markets that look like this one. Lots of competition, lots of capacity for buyers to understand what it is they're buying, and transparent pricing. There's a symmetry between buyers and sellers, and there probably isn't any surveillance. It is very difficult to escape the reach of the big tech travel players, no matter where you travel. Being aware of that reach in all your engagement with your mobile device and with your computer is a good start. And then you need to find ways to make sure good local businesses are the big beneficiaries of your travels. There's one more piece to come in this series of three videos on how travel has changed forever. Thank you for joining me on this rather long and complicated ride. If you're still with me, I can only assume it's in part because of the gorgeous places that I've been showcasing from my travels this year. And I should name them. Northern Vietnam is one of the most wonderful places on earth. I love traveling there still. And I also had some footage from Cambodia. Uh, I had some footage from Canterbury and Kent in the UK. Fremantle, Western Australia, and my home where I'm presently based, Sydney in Australia. They're all fabulous places. And uh, if you'd like to travel with us some more, you can subscribe to this channel. You can also head over to rustycompass.com. And if you would like to travel with us in person, you can check out our special little tours at oldcompasstravel.com. We operate little walks in Ho Chi Minh City, in Saigon, in Vietnam and here in Sydney, Australia, and we also operate some interesting longer tours in Vietnam and more to come in Australia and elsewhere. Thank you again for joining me and we will talk again soon. It's getting windy here. Be well, talk soon.